Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It is the 4th of October and a quieter week this week. Obviously last week was Ignite, last week's video was like 45 minutes long covering a huge amount of updates. This week there's a lot less stuff. As always, if this is useful, um, please give me a like, subscribe, comment and share. And I do want to say thank you. Uh, hit 30,000 subscribers this week, so that was awesome. I'm uh, obviously nowhere near as popular as people that can eat 10 Big Macs, but uh, that was kind of a, a cool little thing, and I appreciate your support. Talking of support, um, next Saturday I am doing the full uh, virtual Ironman. This is in support of Cure Childhood Cancer, so if you can spread the word or maybe even donate, that's certainly appreciated for the charity. This will be me doing a 2.4 mile run, then a 112 mile bike ride actually on the Kona course on my Wahoo bike. So uh, the gradient changes, it gets harder as it would be a hill. It's actually like riding the course. And then a 26.2 mile run, walk, uh, crawl. And so this will all be tracked. Okay, so new videos this week. Obviously there was the big Ignite update last week. I released part four of the Azure Masterclass. This was all about resiliency, availability zones, sets, geo-balancing, app architecture, um, very detailed video. I then released a kind of a demonstration of virtual machine scale set auto scale. I did the demo based on a queue depth. You can imagine you had some workload that was monitoring a queue and processing. So the queue got too big, well it would spin instances out. Um, once the queue depth got below a certain number, it could spin them back in. So I showed how you would configure that auto scale and how you can actually see the scale happening. I also released one of my kind of virtual mentoring. This one was about time management and really just working your butt off. So that's there as well. So on to the actual changes. So on Azure Compute, the Azure Kubernetes service, two pretty big updates. The first was around diagnostic support and auto node repair. For, this was there for Linux and for now Windows Server Container workloads as well. So the diagnostic support, this is if you go and look at a Kubernetes cluster, what you can actually see is you have this diagnose and solve problem option. So here you can see right here this diagnose and solve problems. So if we select that, what it really lets you do is it's going to say, well, what sort of thing are you looking to solve? Is this cluster insights? Is it networking? You could search and type in what describes your issue. In this case, I could go and describe, click one of these keywords. And it says, okay, you said networking. What is it to do with network and connectivity? And it's actually going to go and using intelligent means, it's going to self-diagnose, looking at, well, if it can find problems, and just give you guidance to try and sort of diagnose and solve whatever's ailing that particular Kubernetes cluster. So that's going to work with both Windows and Linux actual nodes, actual clusters. The auto repair, so this is all about nodes check in. You can think about there's the agent that checks in continuously. So if for 10 minutes it hasn't got a status update or for consecutive 10 minutes it's saying it's not ready, it's going to go and try and heal it. So the first thing it will do, which will fix 99.99% of any problems, have you tried turning it off and on again? Uh, so it will reboot it. So it will reboot the node. If that doesn't fix it, then it will actually try to etch a sketch, shake it up and re-image it. If that doesn't fix it, we'll actually just spin up a new node and image that. So we'll actually go and, hey, try auto repair fix if we have these unhealthy nodes. We also now have the DCS v2 support for nodes. So this is all around the confidential computing. You have the SGX capability of the processor. And this is those trusted compute capabilities. We get these secure enclaves, these protected areas of memory and processor where I can run various workloads. This is kind of that highest level security protection even within the OS itself. So now I can have worker nodes using that type of VM. I can have a pool of those 
to run secure containers in my AKS environment. We now have recurring maintenance windows for dedicated host and isolated VMs. So dedicated host, we talked about it a number of times on previous sessions. I just get the entire box for me. I buy it of a certain type and I fill it up with virtual machines of that type. Isolated is when I, I get a VM and it's so big it takes up the whole box. There's no other tenant on that physical server that's hosting that VM. So for those, because it's just me, I can control the maintenance. I could put maintenance off for up to 35 days. But I still had to manually say, okay, now go and do the maintenance. What this capability does in preview is now I can actually set a recurring maintenance window. So that maintenance window has to be at least two hours, and it has to be at least every 35 days. And I can also set other options like every Wednesday, every three weeks, etc. And now at that recurring interval is when it will apply the host level updates, the things it has to do to the Azure fabric. So now I can set that recurrence. And it's also available for virtual machine scale sets. So the same type of capability with VMS, VMSS, we have auto OS update. If I create my scale set from saying from the Azure marketplace and image in there, or if I have my own custom image in the shared image gallery, if I update the version of that image and I've turned on auto update on my VMSS instances, it will automatically roll out the new version of the OS. It will do maximum 20% at a time and just redeploy those instances running the new OS version. So I don't have to worry about patching. Hey, the new image version's out. It's got the patches. It's going to auto roll that out on my BMSS instance. Well, now I can control when it does it. So what I have to do is I define, again, a maintenance window. It has to be five hours or more, and it has to be daily. And then I create that maintenance configuration and then link it to my scale set. So now that auto update will apply within that maintenance window that I've actually specified. So I now have basically uh, more control of that. On the storage side, so Azure Database for Postgres now has a long-term backup capability. So this is hooking into Azure Backup but it's not using a recovery services vault, it's just using a backup vault. So this is kind of a new type. It's designed for some of the newer workloads like Postgres. It's really just sitting directly on Blob, but through that I can see different tiers, like my regular access tier and then archive tier, where it's not immediately available, but it's much, much cheaper. So what I can actually now do is if I actually jump over what I can see is if I go, for example, here to Backup Center, and if I go and look, for example, at protectable data sources, well, one of the things I could actually do now, if you talk about data source type, you can see here I have this option of what type I want to protect. Well, I could always change that to things like, hey, Postgres. And there I can see my Postgres database. So I can actually now go and configure protection for Postgres. It will protect it to my backup vault. So if I actually see here, I've got backup vaults. So that's different from a recovery services vault. I've got my backup vault. And then I can apply policies to that. And what I can do with the policy is I can say, hey, I want to keep it in regular blob. So it's instantly available for a certain amount of time. And then I can say, and long-term retain it in archive. Remember, archive is the cheapest tier, but it's not immediately available. It has to be rehydrated from archive up into cool or hot. And that might take a number of hours. I want to keep that for up to 10 years. So I can now have that configuration um, for my Postgres databases. And it's all, again, managed through Backup Center just that different type of vault. It's not a recovery services vault that we're used to for VMs. It's this new backup vault. It has role-based access control. It's available even if something happens to kind of that backup infrastructure. I can still go and get to it. Shared disk is now available in all regions. So premium SSDs, 
they are pretty much available in every region. So now shared disk is available in every region. And if ultra disk is available in that region, well that also supports now shared disk. So remember the whole point of shared disk is the idea that, hey, get to my board. I have the concept of a managed disk. So I've got my managed disk and I have a property called max shares. Now what that can be does vary depending on the type. If it's of type ultra, that max shares can be from kind of one to five. I can configure that. Um, I think if it's kind of like a, a premium 15 or 20, it can be set to two. I think if it's a 30, 40, 50, it can be set to five, 60 or above, it can be set to 10. So then what I can do is I can have multiple virtual machines connect to that same disk and it will appear as shared storage. So it supports things like SCSI, um, persistent reservations. So I can run Windows clusters, Linux clusters on that that want some shared storage, why well, can now use that? Now, if this is an availability zone, when I create the managed disk, it will be in, for example, AZ1. Well, then both of these have to be AZ1 as well. I can't mount cross zone. So if the managed disk was created in an availability zone, those VMs have to be in the same one. Uh, if it's just regional, it's going to also align the, the physical clusters to meet that. So now we have that um, shared disk uh, pretty much available everywhere. Ultra disk is now available in more regions. So um, Australia Central, India Central, Korea Central, US Gov Texas, basically adding more regions that support ultra disk. Miscellaneous. Um, there was some new Azure Advisor. So Azure Advisor is this thing we really want to go and look at at least weekly. It has advisements around sort of cost optimization, performance, um, security, many different aspects. It's really just free advice. So we want to go and check that out. And what it is, it's got a number of new types of recommendation. The first is around Windows Virtual Desktop. Now, Windows Virtual Desktop, we have pools. We have these pools of virtual machines that are all identical. And what we can actually do is we can check off certain pools as something called the validation environment. And what that means is when updates are rolled out, it goes to that validation environment first. The point is we want to check the things are actually working before we roll it out to our kind of mass Windows Virtual Desktop environment. And obviously we don't want everything labeled as validation environment. So what this new recommendation does is if I don't have a certain pool, at least have a one or two labeled as validation environment, it's going to say, hey, you should have a validation environment in your Windows Virtual Desktop deployment. Likewise, if I have more than 50% labeled as validation environment, it's going to say, hey, you should probably kind of step that back a bit. Additionally, if I have H-based clusters, if it detects high write latencies, it's going to tell you to go ahead and turn on um, basically accelerated write. What that does is attach a premium SSD to get me a lower latency, high performance write on that environment. So it's just now giving me some additional recommendations. So that was it. Again, shorter than last week by a lot, uh, but some cool things uh, we should definitely take note of. Until next week, as always, stay safe and take care.